Ready to start? Okay. Well, good evening. We'd like to get our chairs in as quick as possible and get started. It's, um, there's a long line of people coming in and uh, it's a little hard to start while they're still coming in, but we'll let them try to get in and just gonna say, praise the Lord, amen. Praise the Lord, amen. Praise the Lord, he's good, isn't he? Did, that, did anyone enjoy the meetings that they were just in? Good, and we have a lot to be thankful for. Come on in, we encourage you to come on in. Please come in soon and, and find your seat and we'll try to get quiet as soon as possible. Okay, I'd like to uh, invite you to I want to invite you to kneel where possible or bow your heads as we ask a blessing. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we can come before your throne of grace and mercy and, and plead the merits of our Savior, Jesus Christ, his atoning blood shed for our sins. And Father, we'd have nothing without you. We're told that in thee we live and move and have our being. If we have any words of wisdom, any thoughts of comfort, consolation, any words of encouragement, they all come from you. Your word is truth. Help me to rightly divide the truth. Help me to rightly present it in the best way possible. Give our congregation ears to hear that they'll receive the truth. Give them feet that will walk in the truth and hands that will follow the truth. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we were discussing gospel order. morning we were discussing gospel order and that God is a God of order. Order is heaven's first law and that God wants his church in earth to be run like things are in heaven in an orderly way. We closed our meeting this morning by reading this quotation from Spotty McGann collection that God does not want a collection of independent atoms. He wants an organized body. I'd like to continue by reading a statement. This is from a testimony. It's a special testimony to the Brethren in Battle Creek. This was written from Sunnyside. Does anybody know what Sunnyside or where Sunnyside was? What was it? It was in Australia. That was the, actually the name of Ellen White's home. She lived in Currambong in Australia, and her little home she had built there was called Sunnyside. I've had the pleasure to be in Sunnyside. It is a really cute little place. She says, my brethren, the Lord has called upon you to do a certain work, but you have not done it. And now in the place where you are, there is discord and contention and strife, but this need not be. God does not design that his workmen shall stand apart as independent atoms. All have a great and solemn work to do, and it is to be done under God's supervision. Sometimes I think, friends, we have people who are working as independent atoms because they believe that if they start to work together, somehow their work is going to be diminished. Or let me just be really frank. You have many groups of independent ministries, and they all get a piece of the pie right now. Do you know what I mean by that? a financial piece of the pie. And somehow, if we were all to get together, my slice of the pie just might not be as big. But she says here that we all have a great, we all have a solemn work to do. But it needs to be done, friends, under God's supervision. And the way God wants to work is to work through his church body, through leadership, that through his Holy Spirit and the working of the people, 
have been delegated to do that. This is from letter 16 of 1893, paragraph 20. Again, I say, the Lord hath not spoken by any messenger who calls the only church in the world that keeps the commandments of God, Babylon. Now listen to this, and we're going to come back to this. I'm not going to leave you hanging, I promise. True, there's chaff with the wheat, but first gather the chaff and bind it into bundles to burn it, and gather the wheat into the garner. I know that the Lord loves his church. It is not to be disorganized or broken up into independent atoms. She says there's not the least consistency in this. There's not the least evidence that such a thing will be. Those who shall heed this false message and try to leaven others will be deceived and prepared to receive advanced delusions, and they will come to naught. In Gospel Workers 487.2. And by the way, the point I want to make is, and I'm going to come back and deal with the part about Babylon in a little bit, if we have time. If not, I'll do it in the morning. But the part I want you to notice is that God's church is not to be disorganized. It's not to be broken up into independent atoms. In Gospel Workers 487.2, some have advanced the idea that as we near the close of, close of time, every child of God will act independently of any religious organization. But I have been instructed by the Lord that in this work, there's no such thing as every man's being independent. The stars of heaven are all under law, each influencing the other to do the will of God, yielding their common obedience to the law that controls their action. And in order that the Lord's work may advance healthily and solidly, his people must draw together. So friends, we need organization. But the question is, what kind of organization do we need? Continuing in Gospel Workers, she says, Oh, how Satan would rejoice if he could succeed in his efforts to get in among this people and do what? What does Satan want to do? Disorganize. But the work at a time, she says, the work at a time when thorough organization is essential. God says that a good, thorough organization, a thorough organization is essential, and Satan wants to cause disorganization. And it says that thorough organization will be the greatest power to keep out spurious uprisings and to refute claims not endorsed by the word of God. Let me just pause there for a minute. In our One True God movement, we see so many, so many offshoot ideas. And the reason that we're seeing so many is because we have allowed Satan to keep us in a state of disorganization. If we had had better organization, thorough organization, friends, it would have been a great, the greatest power to keep out these spurious uprisings. She says, we want to hold the lines evenly, that there shall be no breaking down of the system of organization and order that has been built up by wise, by the, by wise careful I'm sorry, I'm reading this wrong. An order that has been built up by wise, careful, and I think I left off a word there, but she's speaking about men like Elder James White, Andrew Smith, and others. License must not be given to disorderly elements that desire to control the work at this time. And I think there should be a word after careful there. Maybe men, we can look that up in a little bit later. I'll bring that to you next hour, next time I'm here. And actually the apostles, page 164. In paragraph one. The Lord in his wisdom has arranged that by means of the close relationship that should be maintained by all believers, Christian should be united to Christian and church to church. Thus, the human instrumentality will be enabled to cooperate with the divine. Every agency will be subordinate to the Holy Spirit, and all the believers will be united in an organized and well-directed effort to give to the world the glad tidings of the grace of God. Now, it says every agency will be subordinate to what? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. When Ellen White came back from Australia in 1901, and one of the reasons she came back was she felt a tremendous burden to attend the general conference session. And they were meeting in the Battle Creek Library a couple days before the conference actually began. And she was speaking to people there. And she says, it is not wise that one man be the head of the general conference, 
She says, we want the Holy Ghost to be king. You can read that in Spalding McGann collection. I can give you the reference later. But we should be subordinate, she says, to the Holy Spirit, and all the believers will be united in an organized movement. Did that say all the believers? Maybe that doesn't mean the believers in Kenya. Maybe it doesn't mean the believers in the United States. Maybe someone is excluded from that. She says, all the believers will be united in an organized and well-directed effort to give to the what? The world. Friends, we need all the believers organized, working together to give to the world the glad tidings of the grace of God. Now, God does not mean that we should, should have a pope over our church, nor even a president over a conference, but we need leadership. She says, and this is in volume A of the Testimonies, 236.3, God has not set any kingly power in the Seventh-day Adventist church to control the whole body or to control any branch of the work. He has not provided that he has not provided that the burden of leadership shall rest upon a few. Representatives are distributed among a large number of competent men. And so God doesn't want just a few people running the church. He wants representatives of competent men. It says, every member of the church has a voice in choosing officers for the church. The church chooses the officers of the state conferences. Delegates chosen by the state conferences chooses the officers of the union conferences. And the delegates chosen by the union conferences choose the officers of the general conference. By this arrangement, every conference, every institution, every church, and every individual, either directly or through representatives, has a voice in the election of the men who shall bear the chief responsibilities of the general conference. That's volume eight, page 236.4. Now today we don't maybe all have state conferences and union conferences and general conferences yet, but whatever we have, the point is this, that when you have just two people, just two people, you don't need very much organization, right? And if you only have 10 people, you still don't need much organization. But when you get 20, 50, 100 people, 1,000 people, you need organization. And the more people you have, the more organization you have. And the more people you have, the more levels of organization you're going to need to work. Now, we're not at the same place the Seventh-day Adventist General Conference is today. But neither are we at the place the pioneers were in 1844 when there was about 50 people total that survived that first disappointment and came out of it and said, we're going to go forward. But this brings up a question since probably virtually every one of us has either left, been disfellowshipped from, or never at the beginning joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Are we authorized to begin a new organization? The Spirit of God has told us through his messenger this. After the passing of time, God entrusted to his faithful followers the precious principles of present truth. God entrusted to faithful followers precious principles of present truth. That's Selected Messages, Book 2, page 389, and paragraph 3. And then a little bit more in the next paragraph, she says, those who pass through these experiences are to be as firm as a rock to what? The principles that have made us Seventh-day Adventists. Well, I thought getting your name on the church book made you a Seventh-day Adventist. Is that what makes you a Seventh-day Adventist? It says it's holding as firm as a rock to these principles. What principles? The principles that they developed early. Not things that came in later, friends. Not things that radically changed a century later or more. We have been told Continuing in the next paragraph, the Lord has declared that the history of the past shall be rehearsed as we enter upon the closing work. The Lord has declared that the history of the past. What was the past history? People coming together, organizing, taking precious principles of truth and binding together by them. Every truth that he has given for these last days is to be proclaimed to the world. Every pillar that he has established is to be strengthened.
time, if I get my time, I'm going to be talking to you about the pillars of our faith and what the spirit of prophecy says about them. And I don't think you should miss that. Every pillar that he has established is to be strengthened. We cannot now step off the foundation that God has established. We cannot now enter into any new organization, for this would mean apostasy from what? The truth. Now, this was written in 1905. You see the date on the screen, 1905. This was written at the height of the crisis that was going on with Dr. Kellogg and his pantheistic views that were put in the book, The Living Temple. And she says, we have truths that God has given us. And if we step off these truths, this is the equivalent of stepping into a new organization. So I want you to notice what we're looking at here now, the points that we have established. Point number one, God entrusted to the Seventh-day Adventist Church what precious principles of present truth. Precious principles of present truth. Two, it is these principles that makes someone a Seventh-day Adventist. I can claim to be a Seventh-day Adventist, but if I'm not even keeping the Sabbath, or if I'm only giving it lip service, if I don't believe in the heavenly sanctuary, am I a true Seventh-day Adventist in God's eyes? No. I may have my names on the book, and I could be in good and regular standing because I write my check every week. That's what's important. The friends in God's eyes, I'm not a Seventh-day Adventist. Number three, to step off the foundation of these principles, to apostatize from these truths results in a new organization, and that means a new church. Friends, when the professed church steps off the foundation which God has established, discarding the pillars instead of strengthening them, they have formed a new organization. Now, I've heard it said here a couple times, and I think most of you have heard, about some great changes that took place, at least formally took place, in Adventism in 1980. What happened in 1980 that was so significant? Okay, there was a general conference session held in Dallas, Texas, where for the first time, listen to me, for the first time ever, delegates came into a general conference session to discuss and vote on fundamental principles of belief. And at that general conference session, they made some changes. But prior to that session, there was a certain amount of concern that was circling in the church because people knew this was going to happen. It had been decided at the fall councils, you know, that, that they were going to have this on the docket at the general conference and to try to calm the nerves of the people. Elder Wilson at the annual council meeting in 1979, prior to the General Conference in 1980, he's, he stated this. He said, our doctrines cannot be changed. Oh, really? Oh, really? Our doctrines cannot be changed without changing the nature of the church. He says, let the word go out from this annual council that any attempt to tear down the pillars of the faith will be resisted. Oh, friends, don't worry. All is well in Israel. Nothing's going to change. We may rewrite things. We may put it in new modern language, but the truth will be there. Did that happen? No, it did not happen. And Wilson made, though, a very acute, accurate statement here. He said, you cannot change the doctrines without changing the nature of the church. Think about it for a minute. What makes the Baptist church the Baptists? Is it because they, they bring fried chicken to the potluck dinners? No. It's not because of those kind of things. It's because of what they believe. What makes the Pentecostals what they are? What they believe. What makes the Roman Catholics what they are? What they believe. When you change what you believe, you change the nature of your church. And Neil Wilson was the father of the current General Conference president, in case you didn't know. Now, I'm not going to take time to go through a lot right here of the, uh, the fundamental principles and the past and present. I could do that, but I think most of you are informed and my time is short. But, you know, in 1872, 1889, they published Fundamentals of Belief. And in there, they talked about God, that there's one God, a personal, spiritual being, the creator of all things, omnipotent, omniscient, 
and eternal, infinite in wisdom, holiness, justice, goodness, truth, and mercy, unchangeable and everywhere present by his representative, the Holy Spirit. Point number two, that there is one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Eternal Father, the one by whom God created all things and by whom they do consist, that he took on him the nature of the seed of Abraham. But in 1980, they changed it and they put in something they called the doctrine of the Trinity in a formal way. And that said that there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. Do you know where they got that language? Where from? The thousands of them were from. Well, this terminology actually comes from the World Council of Churches. But where they got it from was from the Council of Constantinople 381 AD, AD 381. And you can go back and you can look at this and you can see it goes right back to Catholicism, but the exact wording is actually out of the World Council of Churches by our Constitution. God is immortal and all so on going on down. Um, the, the fundamental was changed slightly in 2015 at the San Antonio General Conference. There, instead of the word he, they put God, who is love, is forever worthy, et cetera. They made a slight change there. Um, and here we have also uh, about God. He is omniscient, transcending all space, et cetera, et cetera. The 1980 fundamental on the Son. God, the eternal Son, became incarnate in Jesus Christ, forever truly God. He is now God, the eternal Son. Uh, the Holy Spirit. God, the eternal Holy Spirit, and so on. I won't take time to read too much more on those because I think you know that the differences are very apparent. The fundamental principles have changed. The nature of the church has changed. Ellen White, by the way, let me ask you something. The prophet Daniel, in Daniel 8, 14, in the 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. When he was given that prophecy, did he understand it? He didn't understand it, did he? There was a part of this vision that is described as the Mara that he didn't understand. And he was given years later in Daniel chapter 9 an explanation of the Mara. But I doubt even at that point he fully understood it himself. And I believe that there were times that Ellen White was given instruction that she probably never in her life, slightest dreams could understand the implications of it and where it would lead to. But here's one. This is a statement. You can find this in Selected Messages, uh, Book 1, page 204, paragraph 2. And I've broken it up into several slides for you. The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillar of our faith and engaging in a process of what? Reorganization. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? Now, she says that Satan's going to try to do something. She doesn't, at this point, say it's going to be successful. She doesn't say it won't be unsuccessful. She just says, if it happens, here's what the result will be. The principles of truth that God and his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be what? Discarded. Our religion would be changed. If you give up those principles, if you change your principles, don't you change your religion? Naturally follows, doesn't it? The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. She wrote this in 1905. Those principles that they'd held for all those years, they'd be counted as, as error. I was in the... Just a second. I was in the Andrews University Seminary Chapel a few years ago. And one of the leading Adventist theologians, especially a theologian who deals specifically with the doctrine of the Trinity a lot, a lot, his name is Woodrow Witten. And I have nothing personal against Elder Witten. I've met him. I know him. Um, there's a lot to like about the guy. I'm just to say that. But he stood in the pulpit and he called our pioneers, and I quote, theological crackpots. He said they were theological crackpots because they believed in the doctrine that uh, Jesus was the Son of God and they didn't believe in the Trinity. This would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. 
but it looks like the organization is the very same thing. But friends, even though it carries the same name, it's become a new organization. She says books of a new order would be written. And that certainly happened. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. You can't be ordained in the United States as a minister anymore unless you have a master's of divinity degree. You know, this, this thing that everybody's got to be funneled through the seminary. We've got to teach them all the same thing. They have to have all this intellectualism. The founders of this system would go into the cities and, well, it says do what they think. At least it's a wonderful work. The Sabbath, of course, would be what? Lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. It's a new organization, a new movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice. What are those next four words? But God being removed. It doesn't say God left even. God being removed. They've removed God. They've pushed God out. We don't want you anymore. They would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be built on the sand and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. And friends, that last part is the only part that's not been fulfilled yet. You're probably familiar with this statement. This was written by George Knight several years ago. He says, most of the founders of Seventh-day Adventism would not be able to join the church today if they had to subscribe to the denomination's fundamental beliefs. More specifically, most would not be able to agree to belief number two, which deals with the doctrine of the Trinity. And here's a copy of the actual magazine if you question my documentation on it. Now, we need to understand, friends, that there are principles, spiritual principles of separation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 through 17. He says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And if you look at the screen, if you can see the screen, these words, this expression, come out and be ye separate. Notice that they're emphasized, they're in white. In the, if you actually read the Greek text, those words are in what is called an emphatic mode. They are, they're saying that this is something you've got to do. It's not just something maybe you think about doing. It's not an optional thing. This is something you got to do. Do this. Come out. In Great Controversy on page 45, we read about some of the early believers. It says, after a long and severe conflict, the faithful few decided to dissolve all union with the apostate church if she still refused to free herself from falsehood and idolatry. They saw that separation was what? An absolute necessity, not just a necessity, but an absolute necessity if they would obey the word of God. They dared not tolerate errors fatal to their souls and set an example which would imperil the faith of their children and children's children to secure peace and unity. They were ready to make any concession consistent with fidelity to God, but they felt that even peace would be too dearly purchased at the sacrifice of principle. If unity could be secured only by the compromise of truth and righteousness, then let there be difference and even war. I think we're soft today. I don't think we begin to understand what this really means to us. Well would it be for the church and the world if the principles that actuated those steadfast souls were revived in the hearts of God's professed people. There is an alarming indifference in regard to the what? The doctrines which are the pillars of the Christian faith. The opinion is gaining ground that, after all, these are not of vital importance. But friends, they are. This degeneracy is strengthening the hand of the agents of Satan so that false theories and false delusions, which the faithful in ages past imperiled their lives to resist and expose, are now regarded with favor by thousands who claim to be followers of Christ. People died for those truths, and today we accept the errors 
and we revel in them. We think they're great. Also in Desire of Ages, page 232.2, .2, and I've broken it into two slides. As the light and life of man was rejected by the ecclesiastical authorities in the days of Christ, so it has been rejected in every succeeding generation. Again and again, the history of Christ's withdrawal from Judea has been repeated. When the reformers preached the word of God, they had no thought of separating themselves from the established church, but the religious leaders would not tolerate the light, and those that bore it were forced to seek another class who were longing for the truth. In our day, few of the professed followers of the reformers are actuated by their spirit. Few are listening for the voice of God and ready to accept truth in whatever guise it may be presented. Often, those who follow in the steps of the reformers are forced to turn away from the churches they love in order to declare the plain teaching of the word of God. And many times, those who are seeking for light are by the same teaching obliged, obliged, obliged to leave the church of their fathers that they may render obedience. And if you don't know that word obliged, it means it says make someone legally or morally bound to an action or course of action. You are morally bound if you are obliged. They were obliged to leave the church of their fathers. These references just quoted firmly declare that the biblical principle of separation must be followed to be faithful to Christ. To remain in apostate church would be to partake of its sin. Now, friends, God has called for reorganization. At times when wrong principles were adopted, God called for reorganization through his servant, Ellen White. For example, in 1901, I mentioned that she was speaking at the Battle Creek Library before the conference. In the General Conference Bulletin of April 3, 1901, she said, wow, look at this, that these men, now she's speaking about some men. She's speaking about the leaders of the General Conference. She's on the platform at the General Conference, and these men are sitting behind her. And she says this, that these men should stand in a sacred place to be as the voice of God to the people, as we once believed the General Conference to be. That is past. What we want now is a reorganization. We want to begin at the foundation and to build upon a different principle. She said this church was becoming hierarchical. These men were ruling. We've got to reorganize things. And friends, we need to do that today too. I think it's as clear as can be today that the corporate Seventh-day Adventist church has apostatized from the principles concerning God held during the first 50 years, and thus a new organization, a new church, has been formed. And Ellen White has counseled us that we need to reorganize. reorganize. We don't need to build a new organization. We just need to take this. And when I say organization, I'm not talking about something on paper somewhere in someone's office. I'm not talking about buildings. I'm not talking about structures. I'm talking about a movement of people. We need to reorganize the work. And some of us in America and some of us in Europe and in Asian places are doing that. We invite the churches of Africa to join us. We're trying to reorganize the work. We're trying to work in a way that we can all work together on the same principles that God gave our people. Now, concerning the, the statement that I read to you earlier about Babylon, and my time is almost up because I was told I would have five more minutes, I think, and I have 13 seconds, so I can't do that. But I will come to that later this week. So would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we, we thank you so much for the privilege we have of studying your word together. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity we have to, to read these testimonies from thy servant. And we believe that Ellen White was your child. We believe that you spoke through her, Father, and you gave good things for us through her. And while, just like Daniel, might not have been able to foresee all that the prophecies that you gave him would entail, I'm not sure Ellen White foresaw everything either. But when you take her writings, when we take her writings, we see, Father, that you fully understood and you gave it to her so that we who are living in this time, when these things are being fulfilled, could understand them and we could 
appropriately relate to them. So please bless your people to walk in gospel order, to walk according to truth and light, to be faithful, to do the work that you've given us to do, and that we will bring our lives into line with your character and have pity upon us, Father. We are needy tonight. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.